horror genre has taken many forms over the years. Books to read, games to play, and movies to watch. And one of these forms is the subject of today's video. A series of internet horror stories known as creepypastas. The name is derived from a fusion of the words creepy and copypasta. For the uninitiated, a copypasta is a block of text that is copied and pasted throughout the internet, often containing controversial or humorous statements. And since these creepy stories function like copypasta being spread throughout the internet, that is how they got their name. Anyone could make a creepypasta and had no limit as to what it could be about. Some spoke of normal people becoming deranged, vile serial killers. Some spoke of unknown creatures lurking in the woods. Some spoke of strange phenomena happening in specific places. And some spoke of lost media from famous IPs. Of course, there's so many cooks in the kitchen, they range wildly in terms of quality. But the best ones always stick out in our minds. So as a fan of these stories, I wish to rank my personal favorites, along with the characters they may or may not be about. I'll be ranking them based on three categories. One, how scary is the creepypasta in question? What kind of fear does it elicit from the reader? Or player, the story becomes a game. This will largely be personal as fear differs between people, so expect a great deal of subjectivity. Two, what has been done with the story since its initial posting? Is the story all alone doing the heavy lifting? Or has it been expanded by dedicated fans? It can certainly help to make a story better, or worse. Third, how notorious is the creepypasta? Is it obscure or well known? Did it stay relevant for many years, or was it thrown away right out the gate? All of these will be important factors for how I would personally rank these internet horror stories. Now as all that said... <laughs> Hold on! What the heck is up with my voice? Why does it sound a demonic and... Oh wait, I remember. <sighs> Hang on guys, I gotta deal with something. <laughs> Ugh, that was painful. Don't worry, folks, it's a bit of casual demon possession. My body should revert back to normal by the end of the month. But in the meantime, it fits the season. Now, where was he? Oh, yeah, let's get him ranked. A warning for those who need it. Our first entry deals with heavy topics like pedophilia and sexual assault. If these make you uncomfortable, I recommend you skip ahead to the time on screen. And if you're watching this during the premiere, I recommend you walk away for five or so minutes and come back. As for the rest of you, let's start our list off with a ghost story. There was once a little girl named Sally Williams, and she lived a normal, happy life with her loving parents. One day though, her uncle came by to visit for a few weeks, and he seemed perfectly normal at first. However, Sally's demeanor changed over the course of several days, growing more tired and depressed. Eventually, her mother asked her about it, and Sally explained that her uncle had tucked her into bed every night and, as he put it, played a game with her. The parents planned to get him arrested, but the uncle, having overheard their talk, took Sally to the park on a day when no one was around and beat her to death. To this day, Sally's spirit wanders aimlessly, trying to find her way back home. As you can see, incredibly dark stuff, and it's honestly scary how real this all feels. Especially in today's current climate with lunatics trying to get us to accept minor attractive individuals, as if that's ever gonna happen. However, in terms of fear, that's as far as the story goes. Aside from the ghost part at the end, the story is more sad than scary, and what doesn't help is that not much has been done with Sally outside of it. Sally herself is often portrayed as more of a prankster rather than a vengeful spirit, and aside from a handful of obscure fan projects that feature her, the most that's been done with her character is a popular headcanon where Slenderman was the one to resurrect her as a ghost and even adopted her as his daughter, which is kinda cute, I guess. Even so, I'll give the story credit for how real it feels and being fairly well written compared to the majority of its kind. 
and things can only go up from here. By the way, I promise the following stories won't be nearly as sad. Just good old scares from here on out. Tell me, are you afraid of what goes bump in the night? No? You should be. A while ago, Mitch and his brother Edwin moved into a new house for a fresh start. But after a week, Mitch woke up one day to find a gash on his cheek and one of his kidneys removed. Unsure of how this happened, Mitch was sent back home only to wake up later in the night to see a figure in a black hoodie and a blue mask with a black liquid pouring out of the eye sockets. He manages to snap a picture and escape the figure before it attacks, but he trips in the forest afterwards and awakes in the hospital to hear that his brother had been murdered last night. Going back one last time, Mitch found his brother's corpse and a box containing a kidney covered in the black liquid and a bite taken out of it. That is the story of Eyeless Jack. As someone who's very paranoid about somebody breaking into my home at night, this story hits different. It may not stick too close to how things would actually happen if you lost a kidney, but the idea that this guy or thing is able to surgically remove one of your organs without you ever noticing is a scary idea. And only a scary idea. Because much like Sally, Jack was never expanded upon in any meaningful way. There are a couple fan projects and a fan-made origin where he was sacrificed by a cult and possessed by a demon, but other than that, he remains more of a proof of concept than anything. Still, if this ever gets expanded upon, I'd be down for learning more about this man or creature or whatever he is. He deserves to be more than just an idea. Fun fact about me. I like dogs. I think they're cute and a lot of fun. But this thing, this is no dog. Legend speaks of a mysterious photo circling the internet. The photo is of a husky with a very strange face almost as if it's smiling in an evil manner. And attached to it is a simple phrase, spread the word. Now you might think this is just some kind of joke made by your everyday troll, but the legend goes on to say that if the image is not shared with anyone you know, it will change from an odd looking husky to something much, much worse. From there, the dog himself will appear in your dreams tormenting you and pressuring you to spread his image to all you know, or else things will get much worse for you. If you continue to resist, the nightmares will only get worse, and the weak-willed would even take themselves out just to stop it. However, if you somehow survive long enough without spreading the image, the dog will appear and kill you himself for daring to not submit. What makes the story scary beyond the supernatural elements is that amongst all the shit posts and memes and spooky photos crawling throughout the internet, one of these could actually hold something nefarious, and we'd be none the wiser. It's really easy to pass off something like this as just a joke, but that preconceived notion would just lead to your painful downfall. Now, some people have tried to paint Small Dog as a perfect creepypasta, but while I do agree it's good, there's not enough here to call it perfect. Small Dog has popped up here and there and even gotten his own fan series, but not much has been put into actually expanding the story or the character, which is a shame. I want to learn more about this doggo, but the story is all we have beyond fan and stuff. I do still like it enough to put it on the list, but I really wish we got more. Who knows, maybe someday we will. Anything can happen. So, who here likes a good old government conspiracy theory? Well, scratch the good.
In the late 1940s, Russian operatives created a new gas that would remove the need to sleep and tested it out on five fugitives under the false pretense that they would be freed after a month of no sleep. For the first few days, everything was fine, but things quickly devolved from there. Some of the fugitives attempted to turn over the others in exchange for freedom. Some forced themselves to scream continuously until they physically couldn't anymore. And eventually, all went silent with the only response they could get from the fugitives being a simple phrase. We no longer want to be freed. Afterwards, the soldiers attempted to retrieve the subjects, only to find one dead on the floor and the rest eviscerated yet somehow still alive. Worse still, upon examination of the wounds, they were found to be self-inflicted. They managed to detain the subjects despite violent resistance, which resulted in one dying. But while attempting to replace their vital organs, the subjects continued to resist and beg for more of the gas. In spite of the researchers' protests, the government officials made the decision to put them back on the gas. One of the subjects died before they could be put on, but when the time came to put the rest back on, one of the researchers shot the commander and one of the subjects before turning towards the last one, demanding to know what he had become. With a smile on his face, the subject responded, Have you forgotten so easily? We are you. We are the madness that lurks within you all, begging to be free at every moment in your deepest animal mind. We are what you hide from in your beds every night. We are what you sedate into silence and paralysis when you go to the nocturnal haven where we cannot tread. Upon hearing this, the researcher shot the subject in the heart, and the subject toked out, so nearly free. That may have taken longer to discuss than the others, but it was necessary to convey my thoughts. Now, there are apparent flaws with the story, most notably the weird phrasing that makes it a little unclear how many subjects are alive or dead, and the colorful descriptions of the gore throughout the story. However, it's still an effective scare regardless, especially given how unapologetically corrupt governments are. I honestly wouldn't be surprised if something like this was going on nowadays, much less back in the 40s. Plus, while the ending monologue is a little cheesy, it also gets you thinking about whether the subject's states were truly the result of themselves or something supernatural. If it was just themselves, then does that mean we could all end up like them if we rid ourselves of sleep? And if it's something supernatural, would that mean there's something out there trying to tear us down every minute and is only staved off by our need to sleep? It's a scary thought whichever way you go. Of course, the story is one and done type deal, and despite a couple adaptations here and there, that's probably for the best. It doesn't need to be fleshed out more like Small Dog or Eyeless Jack. It just needs to be a disturbing tale about our need to sleep. And it succeeds even now. Have you ever, uh... Have you ever been spelunking before? Have you ever wondered what creatures lurk in the caves out of sight, yet always near? Well, maybe it's better you don't. I think it's on. That should be on. Um... Alright. Cool. Hi. Um... I'm Ted. Ted and his friend B were passionate cave explorers that wanted to share their passion with the world, and their first internet project involved the discovery of a new cave. The two of them explored this cave, sharing their passion, and began digging through a wall that they theorized led to an undiscovered cavern. But during the process, things began to feel off. They began hearing sounds like shuffling and sliding rock from behind the wall, and when B brought his dog Whip into the cave, she began whimpering the further they went in, implying something dangerous lied ahead. However, Ted and B were blinded by their enthusiasm to discover a new cavern, and when they were able to dig a hole just barely wide enough for them to get through, they found their cavern alright. But it was very, very wrong. There were weirdly placed rocks, a strange slimy substance coating the walls, and an unknown hieroglyph carved into the rocks. Furthermore, on his way back, Ted heard the sound of sliding rock in the distance. He was not alone down there. 
But not really paying it much mind, Ted brought in his other friend, Joe, to share his discovery of this new cavern. Unfortunately, Ted injured himself and had to stay behind while Joe went ahead. And when he came back after an unusually long time, he was a bloody, traumatized mess who was barely even able to speak. When Ted went back down there to find out just what it was that attacked Joe, he could barely find anything amidst the darkness. But noises from throughout the cavern indicated something nearby. Something that was after him with intent, and he could barely make the climb back in time to escape. In the end, the three of them decided that they had come too far and needed answers. This cave had become their lives over the months, and they needed one more trip for closure. None of them were ever heard from again. The fear of the unknown plays a huge part in this story, and given how mysterious caves generally are, it's pretty effective. Sure, we think we got a good grasp on the cave systems of our world, but there's always something else out there yet to be discovered. Or rather, something that shouldn't be discovered. What also helps cement the horror is that we never know what's actually down there. No description of the creature is ever given, allowing us to imagine what it was that lived in that cave. And the cherry on top? This story was created all the way back in 2001, making it the first ever creepypasta. This was ground zero for all the iconic stories and characters we know today, and it still holds up really well. Sadly, it misses out on the top five because it's very much a slow burn that takes a hot minute to really get good. And much like the Russian sleep experiment, the story is one and done. No need or room to expand upon. But despite all that, it managed to remain an icon for so long and even got a brilliant found footage adaptation on YouTube. I think that's more than enough reason to be this high on the list. But, but until then, uh, this has been Ted's Caving Journal. So I guess I'll see you later. Older viewers, did you happen to have an imaginary friend as a kid? Were they by chance a funny little clown? Well, what if that clown was a monochromatic Pennywise? Not laughing now, are you? Why are you laughing, Jack? I'm sure Alice has told you all about me. There was once a boy named Isaac who lived a relatively normal, boring life. But one Christmas, he got a little jack-in-the-box as a present. Upon winding it up, out popped a colorful clown who introduced himself as Laughing Jack, Isaac's not-so-imaginary friend. The two of them spent their days playing and having fun, but one day, Jack accidentally killed the neighbor's cat during a game of pirates. Isaac got blamed for it since no one besides him could see Jack and was sent to a boarding school and Jack was forced to remain in his box until Isaac came back. Unfortunately, Isaac spent a long time away, growing up to become a terrible person, and since Jack was meant to reflect Isaac's personality, his colors faded until his whole body was black and white. Eventually, Isaac returned to his old house, having forgotten about Jack, and he used it to lure unsuspecting people in, kill them, and reconstruct their bodies for different purposes. All the while, Jack watched within his box, utterly fascinated by Isaac's new game. After a while, Isaac found the box and let Jack out, and Jack performed his own long, painful version of Isaac's game on him, letting him experience all the pain he caused before Jack would leave to share his game with the whole world. For a lot of creepypasta fans, this story isn't remembered all that fondly, and there are understandable reasons why. A lot of important things are glossed over, and the colorful descriptions of gore rear their ugly heads again, which was a very unfortunate trend for a lot of creepypastas of its time. Despite that, I still find myself liking Laughing Jack. The concept of an imaginary friend going rogue is a neat idea, and he's got a really creepy design. If you didn't like clowns before, you'll hate them now. Plus, given that he's an imaginary friend, this would make him pretty much unstoppable by conventional means, and he's crafty at what he does. Granted, he mainly targets young kids who are easy to trick, but he can just as easily slip through the fingers of adults too. People may write him off as bad just because of his story being not very well written, but as we will quickly see, a rocky start doesn't define a character. What's done with him going forward is ultimately what matters, and while the content Jack has received isn't much, 
What's there is plenty enjoyable and makes the character creepy yet entertaining. Besides, we can all agree on one thing. However you feel about Laughing Jack, he's still better than Blumhouse's take on the concept. But don't get silly, I know. Because I plan to spread my friendship for all the lonely children around the world. The Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask. No, seriously, that's the intro. You knew it was coming. One day, a college student known online as Jeduzbul bought a copy of Majora's Mask from a yard sale, not really thinking much of it. But upon playing it, he found that the game was not normal in the slightest. Things kept glitching out randomly, music played from the ocarina began playing in reverse, and all the while the Elegy of Emptiness statue kept following him everywhere he went. Was the game old and broken? Or was there something inside it? Jejusable tried to piece together the events to figure out what was going on, and came to the conclusion that a spirit by the name of Ben was possessing the cartridge and trying to communicate to him. Through manipulating the game, Ben had told him the story of how he'd been drowned by a cult and wanted Jaduzable to free him. Jaduzable managed to do so, getting him into the internet. But Ben revealed that it was all a ruse and was now going to enact terrible misdeeds to Jaduzable and the world. This seems like your typical video game creepypasta, but how all of this was relayed to the audience made it truly unique. Through a series of posts and carefully curated gameplay, the author managed to make every bit of it feel authentic. And he even included ARG elements that led to websites about the cult that killed Ben. This whole story was such an undertaking that it quickly became an internet sensation. You can barely bring up Majora's Mask in most discussions without it involving Ben Drown in some way. And believe it or not, this was just the start of a much larger story. Apparently, the story would only get bigger over the course of 10 whole years as the world and lore were expanded upon. I actually know very little about this part of the story, in fact I only just now started looking into it for this video, but from what I've read it sounds very interesting, even if Ben himself was left to the wayside over time. Really the only reason it's not in the top 3 is because of my own preferences, but regardless of that, it's hard to deny the quality Ben Drown brought us, both to fans of Zelda and fans of Creepypasta. Alright, show of hands. How many of you knew Slenderman was going to be here? Okay, how many of you knew he wasn't going to be number one? Huh, surprising. But yeah, this is yet another obvious pick for a list like this. I mean, aside from one other person, Slenderman is arguably the face of Creepypasta as a whole, which is ironic considering the obvious. There actually isn't much of a traditional story for Slenderman. Rather, the earliest content for him stems from the Something Awful forum, where a bunch of pictures depicting a tall, faceless figure lurking in the background were posted. And from there, the legend of Slenderman spread like wildfire. While the origin still remained a mystery, we gradually got to hear more about his goals and his behavior, as well as his underlings labeled proxies. And they made the character more interesting while somehow maintaining his mysterious nature. I would honestly compare Slenderman to Michael Myers. Their backgrounds and origins are largely a mystery, but we're still given enough about them to be compelled by them. That's not to say no origin exists for the character, far from it actually. The fanbase has thought of several different origins for the characters, such as a virus, a reflection of the main character, an eldritch god, which is the one I subscribe to, and a bioweapon purely because Resident Evil Brain. But regardless of whichever one you believe, I think it's better for him to never have a canon origin. Being this creature that we can't possibly comprehend, I feel is a large part of Slenderman's appeal. Any origin you could give him, I feel wouldn't really fit him. And that's okay. We as a species fear what we don't understand. And while we do know some stuff about Slender, we will never fully understand what he really is. And that's truly terrifying. So remember how I mentioned that Slenderman was arguably the face of Creepypasta aside from one other guy? Well, this is that other guy. And while Slender is famous for his lack of a face, this guy's face is his whole thing.
Jeffrey Allen Woods, a.k.a. Jeff the Killer. He was once a seemingly ordinary man who moved into a new home with his family. But not long afterwards, he began having strange, violent feelings building within him. One day, a trio of bullies attempted to mug him and his brother Liu, and that sent him over the edge, causing him to violently beat up the trio. That incident came back to bite him, however, as the following day, cops arrived at his home, and to protect Jeff, Liu took the blame and was arrested. Days later at a birthday party, the bullies returned and fought with Jeff as payback, and during the fights, Jeff permanently snapped and killed all three of them, but not before he was covered in bleach and alcohol and set ablaze with a lighter. After weeks in the hospital, his face was reconstructed, but it came out white as snow, much to Jeff's newfound glee. Later that night, he burned out his eyelids so he could always see his new face and carved a permanent smile into his mouth. Afterwards, he killed his horrified parents and Liu, who was recently released from prison, while uttering a simple phrase, go to sleep. Fellow Creepypasta fans probably know that Jeff's story is considered to be one of the two worst Creepypastas ever made. Heck, people still laugh at it today. So why on earth is it number two on my list? Well, Jeff may have tricked right out the gates, but he sprinted afterwards. Subsequent stories, both official and fan-made, allowed Jeff to truly shine as a vicious, unapologetic madman that's just fun to watch. If Slenderman had Michael Myers energy with his enigmatic nature, Jeff has Freddy Krueger energy where he has an established backstory, but it matters very little to the character. He knows he's a psychopath and he loves every minute of it. The original story may have painted him as more sympathetic, but the truth is, those violent urges were always there. Jeff neither needs nor deserves any sympathy, and while he's well aware of it and loves hamming it up, he can still turn on a dime and be legitimately scary, which is my favorite kind of villain, honestly. And need I mention the sheer amount of characters that spawned from Jeff? Seriously, we got Jane the Killer, a victim of Jeff's murders who wants revenge, homicidal Liu, basically what if Liu survived Jeff's attack and became a killer himself, and Nina the Killer, basically the Harley Quinn to Jeff's Joker, to her at least. And that's without mentioning his fandom relationship with Slenderman that's even more tumultuous than Disney's output. Some people view them as mortal enemies, some see Jeff as Slender's best proxy, and some are as crazy as Jeff and ship the two of them, because us ships are good ships no matter the characters, says the entire hell of a boss fanbase. There's more I could discuss, like the ongoing manhunt for the unedited version of his now iconic image, but all the stuff already speaks for itself. In fact, I personally like Jeff so much that I not only cosplayed as him for Halloween once, but my avatar's clothes are based off Jeff the Killer. Yes, that is why my character wears the white hoodie and black pants. Little fun fact for you. But sadly, Jeff barely missed out on the gold due to a very obvious pick. If you follow my channel for a while now, you know my fans hardly ever shut up about him, and honestly, I can't say I blame him. Come on, you know who it is. I can already hear the groans of cringe and despair coming from the viewers. Everyone knows Sonic.exe for better and worse. Everyone knows it holds the legacy for having the worst written creepypasta ever and having a terrible game alongside it and the author going on his infamous unhinged rant about its reception. So why on earth is this guy at the top of the list? Legit? The same reason as Jeff? but tenfold. A lot of people saw the untapped potential of this demonic hedgehog and made it into something spectacular, from remakes of the original game that expand upon it in new, scarier ways, to original products with a lot of heart and soul, and even original creations based off EXE in games, stories, and analog horror videos. There's a smorgasbord of content to be had, and it's incredible. 
Heck, he even got his own song from the musician Longest Solo Ever, and it not only slaps, but also paints a clear picture of who EXE is and why we see the true potential of the character. I'm well aware that not everyone is going to agree with this placement, and it doesn't really bother me. I'm not going to lose sleep over you hating EXE just because of that original story, and refusing to examine anything else about him, while simultaneously liking the previous creepypasta which arguably started out just as bad as EXE did. Not naming any names. But I didn't make this list to speak your opinion, I made it to speak my own. And in my opinion, Sonic.exe is the best of the best for both the reasons already stated, and the fact that by some miracle, it managed to outlive every other creepypasta. There have been a few others making a comeback, but none of them have rebounded quite like EXE did. Not even Slenderman. We all rightfully mock the original author's unhinged rant, but in a twisted sense of irony, he got what he wanted. Our glorious little Hellspawn did indeed have the last laugh, and he's not gonna stop laughing anytime soon. I'm Tony Sonic, and let me know what your favorite creepypasta is in the comments below. If you're a fan of that sort of thing, I know creepypastas doesn't appeal to everybody, which is totally fine. As for next time, we have what is quite possibly the most important video I've made for this channel aside from the Undertale one. A passion project months in the making, with several people involved, will now at last be showcased to you all. See you on Halloween!